everybody. Today we're going to be going over my externally modulated Johnson Viking 2. And I'm going to show you a little bit of what's going on in the transmitter room behind me. Right behind that door is where all the magic happens. So here we are in the transmitter room, the business end of things. And I haven't showed you guys this yet, so this will be pretty cool. Here we have our exciter. The Johnson Viking 2. This is a 1950s commercially produced transmitter that I use every day. With that is our Johnson Model 122 VFO. This thing was designed in the 1940s and is a tube VFO. It's a little bit drifty, but hey, in the age of ICOM 7300s and SDRs, having a little drift is sometimes a little bit cool. So moving over here to the rack, and this is basically my control center for the entire system. Starting at the bottom, we have some metering that I honestly don't use right now. This was more a factor when I was operating out of this room. Since I moved my operating position into the other room, I really don't use it anymore. Above that is a main antenna switch um, that I use to switch transmitters. So when I want to use my Kenwood exciter, I'll flip this over to the 440 position, meaning Kenwood TS440. Right now, it's connected to the Johnson Viking 2, which is what I mainly use. Above that, we have a couple of Variax. This one controls the Johnson Viking 2. This Variac is in series with one of the legs of the plate supply on the primary side, giving me the ability to lower the voltage feeding the entire system so that I can reduce drive power without detuning anything. And this is possible because it is a class C plate modulated system. Above that, you'll see my homebrew 810 rig. This is a pair of 810s, plate modulated in push-pull configuration. It does about 350 or 400 watts carrier at this time. Uh, I don't use it regularly because I still have to work a few bugs out. But hey, I'm working hard on it and there's gonna be more on this later. Above that, you see some metering. This metering is for the Johnson Viking 2. We have our grid current, plate current, and plate voltage. Below that is some metering for the 810 rig. Now, if we look in here, you're going to see my modulation reactor, which consists of a bunch of chokes. I'm going to go over this later when we draw the schematic. Behind that, you'll see my relay control center. And I built this basically out of spare parts. What we have is a time delay relay that controls my coax switch, the transmit receive relay. Now this has a slight time delay on it. So when I key my foot pedal, which is connected here, and by the way, controls this entire conglomeration, it will key this relay instantly. However, when I let go, of the foot pedal, it's going to hold the TR relay open for just a second to let everything unkey and go away before it switches back to the receiver, just in case my foot slips off the pedal or I, it just prevents hot switching. So that has a slight time delay on it. And there's some contacts here. You can see 24 volts switched, 24 volts switched with delay. That's where my coax relay is hooked up. Now, on the side of it, you'll see these five relays, and these have a whole bunch of contacts on them, which I've routed over here, just as auxiliary contacts in case I wanna add things. This relay controls the receive audio muting on transmit so that I don't have to listen to myself in my SDR while I'm transmitting. The relay next to it controls the Johnson Viking 2, and there's several things that are switched on transmit with that. If I don't want to use this transmitter, I just flip the switch. Now it won't key up. We're going to leave that on. The next relay controls my amplifier. Again, if I don't want the amplifier to key with this system, I just flip it off. We're going to leave that on. The next relay controls the auxiliary exciter, the TS440, and I have it in the off position because I don't want that to go off when I'm using the Viking 2. The fifth relay controls my 810 rig, which is off because it's not being used at this time. And like I said, there are many auxiliary contacts 
on these relays that are available on the terminal strip. So, going one more step up, you'll find the rest of my modulator. As you know, the actual modulator, the Crown audio amplifier, is in the other room. And I'm feeding high-level audio into my modulation transformers, which I think you can see underneath this Lexan. There's two toroidal power transformers under there, made by a company called Antec. Those are my modulation transformers. This conglomeration of capacitors you see here represents my DC blocking cap. This has an extremely high voltage rating on it. All these capacitors are in parallel. What this stuff is here is the three diode ultramodulation circuit based on an October 1956 QST article titled Ultramodulation. There's some series resistors, shot key diodes, and that's about it. This will save my modulation transformer in the event that I exceed 100% negative modulation. It will not allow that. There are several taps on here that will determine the amount of negative clipping. The farther forward that I tap this, the more audio I will be able to put on the carrier and the more positive modulation I will have. I usually leave that tapped pretty low for about 100% to 120% positive modulation. All right. Let's go do some math and draw a schematic. So guys, basically all we're doing here is we're gonna turn four ohms into roughly 3,000 ohms. That's all we're accomplishing with those modulation transformers. You can do this with any rig that you want to. High level, collector modulated, uh, plate modulated, anything with a uh, class C high level modulation you can do this with. So the way that I figured this out, which is the modulating impedance of my 6146 finals, what I did, I just used Ohm's law to figure out the modulating impedance of the final, which was easy because I know that at where I run that Viking 2, the plate current is about 250 milliamps and the plate voltage is about 750 volts. So we divide using Ohm's law, right? Because V over I equals R. This is going to give us 3,000 ohms. So with that information, we know that the output of the modulator is 4 ohms, right? The modulating impedance of the final is 3,000 ohms, so we make that a ratio. We can simplify that. We'll make this a 1, make this a 750. This is the modulation ratio. The way we find the turns ratio for our transformer is to simply take the square root of both sides, and that gives us 1 to 27. Point three. This is the turns ratio for our modulation transformer. Now, I went on the Antec website, and they don't make a transformer that has this exact ratio. However, the transformers are so well built, have such low leakage reactants, that you can literally use them in series. So I will draw exactly how I accomplished that. We have two transformers from Antec. The first one is a 115 primary and a 55 volt secondary. The second also has a 115 volt primary, but it has an 800 volt secondary. Now, both of these transformers have dual windings on both primary and secondary. So I'm going to draw them like this. The first transformer, we have two sets of 115 volt windings, right? On the secondary side of this transformer, we have two sets of 55 volt windings. Don't mind this, it's just, just a rough uh, drawing for you guys. So. Same thing with this transformer. Two sets 
of 115 volt windings, right? And two sets of 800 volt windings. The way that this is hooked up is a little funny and you can't really do this with old iron core transformers. It just won't work. However, for the reasons I stated, you can totally do this with the Antec toroidal power transformers. So what was being done is we're going to take this and turn it around backwards, right? So just ignore the drawing. So we're going to say that these are the 115 volt windings. These are the 55 volt windings. Okay, so we turned it around backwards. I didn't bother redrawing this because why bother? Anyway, here's our crown audio power amp with the four ohm output. And that's about 800 watt, solid state amplifier. So the output of this is going to feed the 55 volt windings, which are actually the secondary, but we're using as a primary. Don't worry about it. These are put in parallel, right? Following so far, the two sets of 115 volt windings just feed right on through. And we put them in parallel. Okay, so far so good. Now, here's where it gets a little bit tricky. The secondary side of this entire conglomeration, we're gonna put these windings in series. So now, this is a 1600 volt winding. One 1600 volt winding. So that ratio, 55 to 1600, is not exactly perfect, but somewhere around, you know, a, a 1 to 28 turns ratio, somewhere in there, maybe 1 to 29. It's close to our 1 to 27.3 turns ratio that we want. It's very close. It works. So with this modulation transformer, we're taking, you know, our modulator here, and we're gonna feed the finals in the Viking 2. So the way that we're doing that is just to simply ground one side of this. We're gonna feed this through a DC blocking cap of some pretty high value because there can be crazy voltages here. This is extremely important. You do not want your B plus or any DC feeding on to this setup. It cannot handle it, AC only. So basically, we're gonna feed the finals from this. Now here's our, our two uh, 6146s, right? Plate and screen. There you go, we're feeding them, but we don't have any high voltage yet. So we're gonna take a modulation reactor choke and I use a whole bunch of them in series, like I showed you, to get, you know, enough, enough Henry there to make it safe. So there you go, our B plus 750 volts feeds right through that, right to the tube. And that is how you use the Antec transformers as a modulation transformer to externally modulate a boat anchor like a Viking 2. Now, if you want to take it a step further, you can add what's called a three diode ultra modulation circuit to this if you want to protect this mod transformer in case you exceed zero volts, baseline, whatever you want to call it. If your negative modulation exceeds 100%, it could be very bad for this. So we don't ever want that to happen. So we're going to add a circuit that I found in a 1956 QST article called Ultra Modulation. And I believe that was October 1956. So basically all it is, is we're going to use some series resistors here to create some taps, right? Now, the total value of these resistors, it needs to equal 
about 3,000 ohms, your modulating impedance of the finals, and it must be rated for at least half of the power that you're going to use to modulate the system. So, that being said, feed through some resistors, and there's three diodes that we need to add. So, <clears throat> we're going to break this for now. We're going to add our first diode right here. And just a side note, these diodes have to be able to handle some pretty high voltages because there's going to be a lot more than 750 there on voice peaks. So I would recommend three to four times uh, just to be safe. And you want to use very, very fast diodes like Schottky diodes. And they make TO220 case Schottky diodes with about a one kilovolt PIV rating. You can get them on Mauser. I put a bunch of them in series. So every time I draw one of these, imagine, you know, five, six, seven, eight, however many diodes you want in series. And that's just to handle extra voltage. So we're going to add that. We're going to add another diode here. And the last diode is going to be connected to a certain tap on these resistors. Now, depending where you tap this is the amount of negative clipping that this circuit is going to give you. So you tap it real far over, you're going to get huge positive peaks and, uh, and the ability to put tons of audio on the carrier. I wouldn't recommend that. It's probably not going to sound as clean as it could, but it does not by any means sound bad if you don't abuse it. So I've run 200 and whatever percent modulation and people told me it sounded great. I don't typically do that all the time, but you can with this circuit. It works. As long as you don't abuse this, you'll get a very soft compression type of effect rather than a hard clipping. But the harder you get into this, the more of a clip it's going to give you, the more distortion is going to be audible. Anyway, you're going to tap these resistors at a point, you know, where you pick. Feed that back in. Last diode goes here. And that be that, Bubba. Now you got a three diode ultra modulation circuit. You're using your Antec toroidal power transformers to externally modulate your 6146s or whatever boat anchor with a modern solid state low THD audio amplifier. Thanks for watching, guys. Let me know in the comments if you enjoyed this video. It was fun to make, and I'd be happy to make more videos like this. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel, and you can check me out on Twitch. I stream almost every day operating, using this stuff. So come hang out, say hi, and, and chat to me. If you have any questions on this stuff, leave a comment, ask me. I'm always happy to respond and help you with anything you want to know. You can also find my email address on my QRZ page at W2BTK. Hope you enjoyed the video, and we'll see you next time.